enough to cry. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last till the end of time. What the world is not is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's. Hey, folks, can we ask a quick favor? Just because the setup of the stage, would people be willing to scoot more to the center just a little bit? Would that be possible? Sorry to make you get up. I know it's end of the day. Really appreciate it. Lord, we don't need another meadow. There are cornfields and wheat fields enough to grow. It's for the next session. All right, thank you all so much. I so appreciate that. All right, um, so just to get us started, I, um, I'm Katie Wells. I um, have tried to start um, every session a little bit differently. So um, not to just point to like what I do, but just I think it's so important to be an advocate and ally um, in the space and time of which we're living right now. And what we really hope to do with this session is um, demystify a little bit of getting involved with advocacy and policy. And we have some really powerhouse, amazing women up here today that I'm so excited for you all to hear from. Um, so I'm Katie Wells, like I said. I am the Director of Social Medicine for the College of Medicine, as well as the Director of International Emergency Medicine and Health Equity for the UVM Health Network. And it is my honor to throw this to Representative Taylor Small. And I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves on the panel um, but just to point out, these powerhouse women that you have here, Representative Taylor Small, Jessica Nordhaus, who is officially representing Congresswoman Balance Office, Senator Jenny Lyons, and Dr. Becca Bell, who is also the VMS um, Vermont Medical Society president. And so again, I'll let them all introduce themselves, but Taylor is going to give a, a quick presentation um, and a level set for the session. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. As was said, my name is Taylor Small. I use she and her pronouns, um, and I am an outgoing state representative as of the end of this year, uh, representing the wonderful city of Winooski. And uh, I think I want to start by really understanding why I want to participate in talking about the Vermont legislature as I'm getting out of the gig. Um, and the piece is, is that when I was starting in politics, there was nothing sexy nor fun about it for me. Um, I saw what was happening in the news in 2019, 2020, and had no inkling to want to go into politics. Um, but then this thing called the pandemic happened, and I went from being very busy to having no plans at all. And in that process is when I got a call from my then state representative, Deanna Gonzalez. And she called and she said, I have a political question for you. Uh, and my exact answer was, I'm not very political, but I'm, I'm happy to help. And she was like, I can't believe that. And so she said, have you ever thought about running for office? And my immediate answer was, no, I haven't. And she was like, OK, well, let me tell you about it a little bit um, and what the process is and why I think you should run for office. And uh, we talked for a good hour. And at the end of it, I said, OK, this sounds very interesting. I'm going to take the weekend to talk to my people. And uh, I'll follow back up with you on Monday. And she said, hmm, I'll call you back tomorrow. I said, OK, so I have 24 hours to decide whether or not I'm going to run for office or not, um, just based off of a one hour phone call. Clearly, I ran for office and got in. Um, but I tell this story to really level set that anyone can run for office. Uh, I did not think of myself as having a political background because I wasn't directly involved in governmental operations. And yet, I know that everything that is going on in my life and the way that I have shown up in community 
is inherently political, and we need folks to see beyond uh, that mirage that we cannot participate. So with that, I think someone should have given me a clicker. Oh, great. Um, here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to review, uh, very briefly, there are three branches of government. Then, I want to give you the Vermont edition and the context of what it means to be in the Vermont legislature. Then I'll go into how a bill becomes a law and then answer any questions that you have before we get to the panel. So three branches of government. I'm not going to go into a history lesson or try to be your social studies teacher about this, but recognizing that there is a separation of powers um, that exists. And so when we're looking at what the legislature does, the legislature is the ones who are writing and voting on laws. Um, this can be about criminal laws. This can be about budgetary decisions. Um, we are the ones who are crafting the way that we want our state to be run. The executive branch, or the governor, is the one who is executing the laws. We'll get into that in a little bit. And then the judiciary is really um, weighing out and balancing our laws, making sure that the laws that we are passing as a legislature are standing the test of time with our Vermont Constitution, um, which just goes to show that there can be laws that are passed that are unconstitutional, which is why it is important for us to have checks and balances between the three branches. But what does that really look like in Vermont? So Vermont, we have what is called a part-time citizen legislature. What does that mean? It means that folks here in Vermont, um, anyone can run for office. And it means that you're serving for about five months of the year, about January to May. And if you're thinking, wow, I wonder about people who have a whole other full-time job. Well, uh, there is the piece in our Vermont law that protects folks who are running for office. Uh, to be able to hold uh, employment while also serving in the Vermont legislature. But inherently, that is a really tough balance. You are asking someone who is doing their work in the community to come away from that work for about five months uh, to then return later on. I also will highlight that the pay for legislators is uh, relatively low in comparison to other states. So in the state of Vermont, the salary for a Vermont legislator is about $20,000 for that five months. If you want to extend that throughout the year, that's about $55,000. Um, and I'll just tell you that the median income uh, for Vermonters is about $65,000 currently. So uh, well below. I highlight this to really show that when we're talking about what it means to have a citizen legislature, uh, it sounds really great in concept of people who are embedded in their communities being able to make decisions that is directly influenced by the people around them. But when we look at the pieces here of how much the pay is, what the barriers are to folks being able to run, it really means that there are a select few people who actually have the privilege and opportunity to serve. It means that we see uh, typically folks who are retired or have time available to be able to serve in the legislature. We're looking at folks who have uh, jobs that really are supportive of them being in the legislature. But when it comes to minimum wage or more gig work, it is really challenging to find that balance. And while we're on the topic of health equity more broadly, I'll also just highlight that there is no health insurance that is tied to it. So if you are wanting to have health insurance, you have to find an employer that is willing, again, to have you leave for about half of the year, make sure that your health is covered, and uh, then be able to come back. Another piece that I'll highlight is just how small our state is. I think we all know that very well. Um, but in the updated census, there are about uh, 660,000 Vermonters. Um, in comparison, if we look just over to New Hampshire, which is about the same geographic size as us, they have about 1.4 million people. So when it comes to representing, we're representing a very small number. Um, for our state representatives, they're serving about uh, 4,000 folks each. And when it comes to our senators, oh gosh, I really wish I didn't put the writing so small. I think it sounds like 16,000. No, 20,000, so close. Um, so it, it really is focused on the communities directly that you're serving. And I highlight that correlation ratio between representatives and how many people they serve, just to show how close of the relationships are. 
Um, one thing that I found really resonating in this work is just how directly available state representatives are in their communities, whether it is this expectation that your phone number is out and available, that you can walk through your community and everyone will know exactly where you live, um, or that there is this expectation that you're going to go to coffee with constituents. I can already see the eyebrows raising in the current political climate about what it means to be so visible and available for folks in your community. And I would say that four years ago, that sounded really exciting to me. It meant that we were deeply connected. And I think now as we're seeing this transition and change in our political scheme, it makes it really challenging for folks who are supposed to be citizen legislators to be able to show up fully and feel safe in uh, providing that care. Um, some separations between the House and the Senate. I won't go too much into this, but out of the 180 members that we have, 150 are serving in the House, and uh, 30 are serving in the Senate. Um, the main separations there are not just the numbers, but also the duties. Um, the House is really working on uh, crafting direct legislation, while the Senate is both crafting legislation and overseeing the executive branch through nominations um, Etc. I'll really let Senator Lyons get into those details if you're more curious. Now, uh, a little throwback. Anyone else love Schoolhouse Rock? Um, do you have the song, I'm Just a Bill, like going through your head right now? I will say between that and Conjunction Junction, uh, the top hits from Schoolhouse Rock. But uh, why I bring this up is so uh, how a bill becomes a law. When we look at it from the federal level, it is very similar at the local level as well. Um, actually, when I came into the legislature, they gave us this really great diagram that shows us what the process looks like. And so I'm going to share this with you today just because when it comes to advocacy, there are really key points of when you want to intercept and have these conversations with legislators. So how, how does a bill even get drafted in the first place? Again, we're a citizen legislature of folks who may or may not have a background in policy. So what happens is the legislator will come forward and say, I have this really great idea. And then they go to legislative council, which are the lawyers in the legislature who actually do the legalese writing. Um, and then it's an editing process of going back and forth of what the language is going to look like. After that process, it gets introduced. And so by introducing it um, in either the House or the Senate, it means that the speaker or the Senate pro tem has reviewed it and that they decide which committee is then going to be working on that bill. Some folks think that once a bill is referred to a committee, that is the best time to be able to get in and advocate. I would say that that is the best time to be able to advocate for a bill being taken up and considered. Just that a bill has been referred to committee does not mean that it will actually be up and taking testimony or even worked on. For example, in this past legislative year, we had over 1,000 bills introduced across the House and Senate. Um, we passed less than 100 laws. So there are so many pieces of legislation that are not being considered. And so it is important in that process to make sure that it is getting the attention that it needs. So once a committee decides and they are starting to work on the bill process, I would say that is your integral time to be able to get in and have the conversations that are necessary. Whether it is in the House or the Senate, um, both processes are happening at the same time. Once a bill leaves its committee of jurisdiction, I will say that is the most challenging time to be able to get in and make edits. Um, once it is going to the House floor for a vote, um, you are now navigating, uh, especially in the House, 150 people now looking at this versus a committee that is usually about 11 to 12 folks when we're looking at the House. And it's a deliberative process. So as you'll see, there is a second reading and a third reading. What this is meant to do is to say that you're not just going to look at a piece of legislation once and say, yep, that looks good. Um, but it gives you that pause and opportunity to come back and say, maybe there's a tweak that should be made here, or maybe we should do something else there. Of course, that sounds really great in theory. Um, in practice, each chamber makes its own rules. And so we choose to follow these rules of having consideration twice, um, but we can also choose to just throw the rules out and move right along in whatever process is supported by the majority. Then what is really integral is once it passes one chamber, it goes right over to the other and starts over again. 
So some folks think that once a bill is already passed out of the House, oh, well, I can't advocate on it anymore. Nope. It just means that you have a chance with the Senate to start working on it once again as they begin their work. And then it goes back and forth for a bit before going to the governor. The governor really has three options at that point. Um, if the governor receives the legislation and they say, oh, absolutely, this is definitely something that should go into law, they'll sign it. If they see it and they go, eh, I really wouldn't have done this myself, um, but I guess it's important. Um, they can let it go into law without a signature. Or, as we're most used to right now, um, our governor can choose to veto the legislation and say, I don't really like what you did there, and sends it back to the legislature to reconsider. At that point, we have an opportunity to either overturn that veto or to let it sustain, and the piece of legislation just is, is laid to rest. Um, the only piece that is difficult about when we uh, come back for reconsidering a veto is that there's no changes that can be made at that point. So even if there was collaboration or um, conversations with the administration, it is really kind of a, a done deal. One piece I really want to highlight ever since uh, the pandemic is that the legislature is the most accessible as it's ever been. Um, you can watch any committee discussion, any hearing on the floor, um, any meeting that is happening in the legislature is streamed on YouTube. I am not saying that these are enthralling or entertaining videos to watch, but it is really uh, helpful to understand the process and how legislators are talking about the various bills that are important to you along the way. It gives you a clue into what their thinking is and what their background is on, on the legislation or the issue specific. Laws are only one way that we change it. The other way is really looking at our Vermont Constitution and saying, are there changes that need to be made there? The difference is if we're going to make a change to the Vermont Constitution, we are really deliberate in saying that we want it to go through two separate legislatures, meaning that it is two different elected bodies that are considering whether we want to change our Constitution or not. And then after that, it is up to the people of Vermont. It goes on the ballot after four years, and they decide, we all decide, whether we want to change our Constitution. We saw this most recently in 2022 with the Vermont Reproductive Liberty Amendment. Um, other considerations have come forward. We might talk about them a little later. But that is the end of my presentation um, so that we can start talking about how you can advocate and what those pieces look like in real life. Thank you all. Amazing. Thank you so much, Representative Small. So I think we'll just hold questions until the end, if that's okay, just so we can kind of get to the panel. So if the panelists wouldn't mind introducing themselves um, quickly, and we're kind of running um, a little bit just because we had all the technical difficulties getting started, uh, a little long. So um, if we can just do quick introductions and we'll get to some discussion, if that's okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jessica Nordhaus. I use she, her pronouns, and I am Director of Community Outreach for Congresswoman Becca Ballant. So I work here in her Vermont office, and um, I cover a large array of issue areas, but uh, focus on health care, mental health, uh, a lot of health and human services issues. Is this on? Oh, it is. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ginny Lyons, a senator. I represent Chittenden Southeast um, and have been in the Senate for many years. I chair the Health and Welfare Committee in the Senate. I'm also on Appropriations, the Justice Oversight Committee, um, a whole number of other oversight committees um, appointed in the Senate. My back, professional background is that I'm a professor of biology and I taught for many years at different places, but mostly in this area at Trinity College, Vermont, before it um, ended. Uh, and I continue to do teaching when I'm invited to different um, schools around the, around the state. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to sharing with you the work that we do. 
Hi, I'm Becca Bell. I'm a pediatric intensivist at the Children's Hospital here. And so I take care of critically ill or injured infants, children, or adolescents. We're the only pediatric ICU in the state. And then I also um, have served in some leadership roles in statewide membership organizations. So the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter. I was the president from 2019 to 2023, which were quite significant years for child health. And um, I'm currently the president of the Vermont Medical Society, which represents about 3,000 physicians and physician assistants um, across the state. And then my academic work is around um, child injury prevention. So I do some work with the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. Fantastic. So I see I mentioned a really powerhouse group of women here. Um, so if you all wouldn't mind, I think one of the reasons we really wanted to hold this session too was to really kind of lower that barrier of entry to folks, to understand how do I even get started in this work? So Senator Lyons, and then we'll throw it to everyone else. Do you mind to give us a brief description of how each of you got involved in legislative advocacy? Uh, thank you for that question. I'll try to make the history short. Um, I was asked by the Republican Party to run the first time and by the Democratic Party the first time I ran. And I chose the Democratic Party because of my um, support for environmental and reproductive issues, uh, reproductive rights and environmental um, protection. Um, how I got involved initially was at the local level with my select board, and I was invited to, to run for the select board in Williston. I became chair of the select board and worked through some really difficult times around development, and you know what Taft Corners looks like. When I first ran for the select board, they were, there were meadows and farms in that area. And it was my job to negotiate and to compromise with the developers in that area and with our environmentally active uh, citizens to make some determinations about what fits best within the town of Williston. And that's another long story. Uh, when I was asked to run for the Senate, it was for those reasons that I had um, allowed for compromise and collaboration at the local level, and folks were asking me to take that into the Senate, and I believe I've done that, and it's been um, a terrific uh, opportunity. My advocacy really is based on a long t uh, line of work that I've done uh, professionally as well as uh, locally. Uh, the healthcare work that I do is really based on trauma-informed care. Uh, I currently chair the Health Reform Oversight Committee and have become very interested in the, in the statewide and global nature of our healthcare system and how to include both geographic equity and social environmental equity within the system itself. So um, that's a little bit about how I got there. And I will just say, you might wonder why I've stayed so long, and I wasn't going to until COVID hit. And that became an intense environment, and I think Taylor can probably speak to that as well. It was 24-7 online, and um, one of the things that happened in 2016, as you know, is we had a change in our national culture around women's reproductive rights and around um, inclusion and equity. We saw the campaign for the President of the United States become really disruptive, and that bothered me greatly. So at that point, I wrote two constitutional amendments. One is a reproductive liberty proposal, which is now in the Constitution. The other was an... I feel that way too, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and the, the other one is the inclusive equal rights amendment that we might talk about a little bit later that has passed the Senate and the House for the first time and looking forward to having it pass again this session, which would be terrific, honestly. Um, so those two things have kept me going and I will, I'll keep persisting, uh, hoping that the second one will uh, pass this session. So a little bit about those things about me. Um, I work closely with uh, 
people like Becca Bell. Um, I work closely with the Children's Hospital. I'm on their advisory committee and with other folks in the hospital and healthcare arena. I also work with community service agencies and I love listening and learning about what you do. And so for me, what maintains my advocacy is you and what you bring to us and to me particularly. Um, one of the things I think Taylor uh, didn't mention, and I don't want to go on too long, I'll end with this one, is that in the Senate we have two committees, in the House you have one committee. So we, we work twice as hard. <laughs> I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm ki kidding, we don't. Uh, we, all we all work very hard, um, but we have two committees rather than one. The other thing is that when you're looking to advocate with folks, it's kind of important to know um, who the chair of the committee is because the chair of the committee really drives the agenda. And so if you can identify me, you know, you can reach out to me and I'll say, oh, please talk with my vice chair or talk with someone else. Or, but usually uh, if you reach out to the chair of the committee, um, you're, you'll make much more progress initially uh, with your with your issue if you're talking about a specific bill so just just so you know that um, not all chairs are the same they won't all meet with you uh, I try to do that as much as I can with folks who are from my district or certainly from the Chittenden County area but so um, I'll stop now and uh, look for more questions later thanks so Jessica or um, Dr. Bell, how would you say you first got involved with legislative advocacy? So I grew up in um, Western Massachusetts, just south of Brattleboro. I did all my training, all my medical training in Massachusetts, and um, except for I did a stint as a high school science teacher in St. Johnsbury before I went to medical school. Um, so I, when I finished all of my training, um, I moved up here to Vermont, So, and I've been here for 10 years. I just got the email that's like, congrats, you get a free toaster now. Um, so I know I've been here for 10 years. So um, my first year that I was here, I was, um, I'll just tell the story because I think it even, um, I think it really speaks to us all understanding and recognizing that we have a voice and it's important. So I was driving home from work, um, late at night I came to the, into the PICU to admit a patient. It was New Year's Eve. I, I saw a Chittenden County bus go by and it had an anti-vaccine ad on it. And I was like, that's so annoying. And so I went home and I sent an email to my chair. And my, my chair, if you don't know, is Lewis First, who um, is like just, I don't know, he never sleeps and checks his email all the time. So he emailed me back, it's New Year's Eve, and I was like, Lewis, we gotta do something, what can be done about this? There shouldn't be this like anti-vaccine ad going around town, coming to the hospital. And he was like, well, we can't do anything about that, but you could write a blog post for the hospital about the importance of vaccines and vaccine preventable infection. And I was like, someone should totally do that. <laughs> Cause it's a problem. And he was like, well, yeah, no, I'm saying that you should. And you know, when you're, especially in medical training or, or anything else where you're just kind of like going through, you're like, there's somebody smarter than me who should be the one to talk about this, like not me. And it took this back and forth where he was like, well, you work in, you're one of like four pediatric intensivists in the whole state. You've, you've seen some stuff. You have your own voice. You have your own story. Like you, you do it. Um, and so I spent all this time like writing this blog post for the hospital and then um, it, now it's January of 2015 and um, there's a measles outbreak in Disneyland like a week after if you recall this like a week after I wrote this blog post and so then um, it's January it's the beginning of the session and so this is all when timing works out right so um, the hospital government operations folks said hey um, some legislators want to introduce a bill about vaccines and school entry. And so they want someone from the hospital to come down to the state house to represent the hospital at a press conference. And we're like, let's get the person who wrote the blog post. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. But like truly like, yeah, someone should totally go down there, but not me. And so it was the same thing back and forth. And that was my first time going to the state house. It was January, 2015 and went to this press conference. And that's where I met the folks from the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter. I haven't, hadn't met them before. And, um, and then after that, it was sort of like, someone needs to go on VPR to talk about this. And again, I was like, 
this. <laughs> okay, guys, stop. Um, and I studied so hard. Never do a live call-in show about vaccines as like your first foray into <laughs> like public speaking. It's like very intense. Um, so, but what I really realized is, um, and I'm so glad Representative Small talked about this because I had this in my notes to make sure to talk about, which is that those who work, those Vermont legislators, that is like true, true service. They do not get paid. Um, they do not have supports, a lot of support staff, right? And so if you are in a bigger state with like a bigger legislature, they have all this staff, right? Like gathering information, talking to folks and supporting them. And so what I have found at the State House is so many folks who are saying, I want to understand what's happening. I want people to inform me. And I want to know who are my credible resources that I can go to to figure out how to solve this problem together. And so they are really looking for credible sources. And those can certainly be individuals. We can talk about that a little bit more. But I think thinking about like, what are the coalitions? Like, what organizations are you a part of, or you can be a part of, or you can join to be that credible resource for our legislators who work so hard to try to figure out how to solve a problem. And so I just have found that really rewarding. And I've, and within the Vermont Medical Society, I mean, we recognize how important it is because policy affects health, like at every level, in every way. So I have found myself testifying, like you think, of course, like Senate health, and House Health, but you know, I've testified to Representative Small's committee in, in human resources and human services and like education and agriculture. We were doing stuff on school, school meals um, or um, government operations. So like basically every level, everything affects health, climate change, right? Like there's everything. So um, so there's an opportunity there because because all these things affect health, and I just um, have found it very rewarding to work at the state or to interact with folks at the state house. And we really recognize we have our um, annual meeting, the medical society next month, and we are recognizing two legislators that we worked with really closely over the last year, um, Representative Lori Houghton and Representative Alyssa Black, who actually also won the Citizen of the Year Award from us many years ago before she became a legislator as a citizen on her um, suicide prevention awareness work. And Senator Lyons has been um, a previous um, recipient, Representative Small has spoken at this event. And so there's just like a lot of interplay between like health and the legislature. and so. We can talk more about specifics on how that, that works, but it's just so important to the health of our patients and populations that we, it's sort of our duty to like let our policymakers know what is actually happening on the ground. And they are very grateful for that information. And, in under, and then when, when something is implemented, it's like, how is that going? How is that working? Um, and so giving that feedback is really important too. Jessica? Thanks. I think if you asked my parents, they would tell you that my advocacy work started when I was about three and had a simmering, deep simmering rage against the idea that I needed to wear shoes in the winter. And so went to work on my parents to convince them why that shouldn't happen. Um, I've since been repaid by a very obstreperous son who insist on wearing orange rubber dinosaur boots all summer, so it evens out. Um, but in my professional life, I feel like um, I, have, I have been, certainly since moving to Vermont almost 20 years ago, been involved in sort of advocacy adjacent work. So whether that was grassroots organizing or school reform, um, working with the Partnership for Change grant to redesign Winooski and Burlington high schools to make them more student-centered and proficiency-based, um, doing communications work, designing neighborhood learning conversations to try to uh, gather feedback. I did work for the city designing an, the early learning initiative here to provide scholarships for families living uh, with very low incomes to afford high quality early childhood education for their kids. Um, so I feel like a lot of that was work that wasn't directly related to legislative work, but certainly informed uh, what was happening and 
having to work sort of side by side with that that bigger s system. Uh, my position before going to work for Congresswoman Ballant was I, um, I worked with the initiative Change the Story Vermont, which was a partnership initiative of Vermont Works for Women, the Vermont Women's Commission, and the Vermont Women's Fund. And we were a time-limited initiative designed to advance women's economic security in the state. And it was really born out of a lack of data about how women really were doing economically. So we spent our seven years producing reports with local data across a wide range looking at gender from all angles and the impacts of bias and the impacts of uh, occupational segregation and impacts on health and wellness generationally um, of some of these issues. Now that the tricky thing about this was because one of our lead partners was the Vermont Commission on Women, we were precluded from lobbying because, fun fact, until recently, the Vermont Commission on Women was the only state commission that was not allowed to lobby the legislature. I'll just let the irony drip there for a minute. Um, that has changed, which is good, but we did have to be very careful, and that was one of the reasons that we really came at it from an educational standpoint, producing reports that then legislat legislators could use and did use frequently to make the case um, for the bills that they wanted to support. Uh, the executive branch often used it to set up programs, state agencies. Uh, we worked with businesses around the state to try to create more gender equitable workplaces. So it was, it was far reaching work and ultimately I think it has given the Women's Commission and um, some other groups the ability to really speak directly to the legislature. Now working for the Congresswoman, uh, I'm in a different role where I am actually actively looking for folks in Vermont to connect with them to help communicate your needs, your, the issues that matter for you, the sticking points back to the Congresswoman so that she can do the work that she needs to do in DC at the federal level and so that she can really understand what Vermonters priorities are and translate that into policy. And happy to talk more about how to do that and how to interact uh, with our office and the tips and tricks as we go along. Representative Small, did you have anything you wanted to add about how you got involved? Oh gosh, I'm so glad you asked, Katie, because um, I wanted to go back to something that Becca mentioned about uh, legislators and the lack of resources. Um, the piece that really stands out to me is around getting the information that is needed to make um, informed decisions on policy. Uh, what was really, what stood out to me is this piece of something that I felt and others have felt of like, I'm somebody should speak out about this, but I'm not the one. I don't have enough information, or there's somebody better who could speak on this. And I just want to remind you all that in the legislature, there are lobbyists. There are folks who are paid to come in and present a single viewpoint uh, to legislators on what they should and should not vote for. They have a goal. They are paid. It's a paid position for them to do this. So if you all are not advocating to your legislators, if you are not coming in and sharing the nuance, the true nuance of what health equity means, there is already going to be someone in their ear telling them how to vote, what legislation should be passed and what legislation should not. Um, and I think what is really challenging for citizen legislators is how do you discern when a lobbyist is giving you information whether it's the full truth? How do you discern that it is just a one-sided story when we're so interconnected in Vermont? Everyone knows everyone. The person that is a lobbyist is also the person that lives down the street from you. Of course they're not going to lie to you. They want to give you, they want to give you the full truth. Um, and this is not me shading lobbyists. It is just reminding us all that there are folks who are going to be in there advocating and making their pieces known. And if we are not doing the same, then that is all our legislators are going to hear. So we have, <clears throat> we have about a little less than 20 minutes left. And so what I'd like for us to maybe to focus on um, are two things. And if we could kind of maybe combine the two. And thinking about 
if we have folks in the audience who are like, you know, I really want to get involved in this process. I feel like you've kind of given me some courage to say, all right, let's get involved. And I've heard from each of you, reach out, contact me. But what are some other practical steps folks in the audience can take to get involved in this space? Any practical ways of showing up or coming into spaces? There might be some hesitancy, Senator Lyons, and just cold emailing you, I don't know. But maybe they're not. And so what, what might be some other ways that folks can really get involved in this process? That's to anybody, yeah. Email is good. Um, sending an email out and uh, just a short email. I have a very important issue that um, I've been facing with my patients or uh, in, in my line of work. Uh, that email with bullets in it saying uh, listed items of concern and could we talk or could we meet, uh, that, that's very helpful. The, um, the other way is to, of course, pick up the phone, but that's actually less helpful simply because I get so many phone calls and messages and sometimes it's very difficult to know which ones are the ones to, to pick. The other piece of this is that when you come with an issue, it's probably important to have both qualitative information, so the stories that you can tell or your patients or your friends or those who you work with can tell, so that qualitative information, and also quantitative data. So in particular, I'm thinking about something that Taylor just said uh, regarding how lobbyists can influence and you have one set of data from one set of lobbyists and another from another one. I went through that this year, and I think Taylor went through it with me, on LGBTQ data regarding vaping and, t and flavors, and how uh, menthol um, marketing has targeted folks in the African American, the BIPOC community. And then all of a sudden, along came a story from a lobbyist that wasn't really clear who this lobbyist was but indicated that if we took away the flavor, we would depri be depriving this uh, group of their menthol. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, where did this come from? And if you, so we had to dig down deep and find out it came from the tobacco industry. So we are confronted with this kind of information all the time. But you can bring data from your own experience, from your work, that is very compelling because it's Vermont data. So data information, I, I, I work very, I'm, I'm very interested in the um, cardiovascular and health effects of smoking overall. I've done research in that area, but also uh, in particular around the vaping epidemic for kids. So when you see that in your practice, it's important to maybe collate some of that data or work with others to put it together and then send the, the email off. And you know if there's someone who's introduced a bill about vaping, that person might be interested in receiving that information. So your advocacy can be very targeted, and we will listen. And you become the expert, because we don't have the staff. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do research, but most legislators don't have time, and they don't have effort. And right now, we're really swamped uh, with work, honestly. So you can help um, a great deal. I, I do think the email's good. Uh, and, and then also working with your um, societies, if you belong to a, a VMS or a nursing society or other program um, that has information, that's also very helpful. That's open to anyone. And <clears throat> the, the one other caveat I was going to say, and Sarah Lyons, you did this beautifully, is if you could also kind of pair that with maybe something you're working on now or a policy initiative or a, an area that you're working on. So anyone else is open to it. Open to the panel. 
Uh, yeah, so I'll just tag on to the society. So um, I know we have a mixed audience here. Some are clinicians, some are students, some are community members, some work with organizations. So if you have a professional society, certainly start with that um, because oftentimes there's a ton of work going on that you don't even know about. So I'd start with that. The other place you could um, check in with, again, depending on your employment, may be your government relations folks if you have them. Um, oftentimes, that scope of what they might be working on is probably is oftentimes narrower maybe than and not inclusive necessarily what the societies are, are looking at i will say like with with vms we have resolutions that are, you know are really far reaching including like we supported um the child care bill for instance because we know that early childhood education improves children's lives, families, communities, and then also our workforce. So we have a lot of data on that, for instance, whereas you might, your employment might not quite have that. And then, so, and then if you're sort of like, this is an issue I care about. Um, it's not really, you know, my government relations folks, or I don't have that in my employment. I don't really have a society is really to see if you can figure out what organizations are working on this already and really just offer your services. I mean, it sounds like, you know, sign up for their email emailing. And so when you say like, okay, I care about, um, you know, um, you know, free school meals for children, you know, who's driving this effort, right? It's a coalition, but the per the group, this, this was passed, the group that was driving, it was Hunger Free Vermont, right? So you go on, you sign up for their emails and they will be very specific with their asks, right? They'll get, you'll get an email that will say, look, this is in, um, this is in health, house education right now. This is the committee that it's in. They're considering striking that, please write to them and say you support this or whatever, I think. So I think that way you don't, I mean, Representative Small did such a great job going through that, but even if you don't know that, if you're following an issue by an organization that's that's really driving the advocacy around it, you absolutely can make a huge difference by just following the asks that are happening and not waiting necessarily until it gets to the floor vote. I used to be like, that's where it happens. And it's like, no, you know that meme that's like, the real lessons are the friendships we made along the way. It's like, the real policy is like the committee work that happens along the way. Like that's where a lot of the stuff happens um, or doesn't happen, right? So I think even as your first sort of foray is really to think about like who's addressing this issue already. And then if you're like, I, there's this thing that I'm seeing and I just don't think anyone notice, knows about it or is addressing it. I mean, I think thinking about the faculty here at this, like just reaching out and saying like, look, we can connect you to people. Um, or you just reach out to your representatives and senators and say like, look, I don't have the answer. I don't really know, but I'm super worried about this issue. You don't need to have the solution. And they might say, hey, this is what we're doing. Or here's a group that we know is working on it. Um, and I think sometimes some of the most powerful coalitions are when you've got groups that actually come at it from really different angles. Um, I think a lot about the very successful um, like Let's Grow Kids campaign where it was like, businesses and early childhood educators and the healthcare sector, like pulling people from all different areas to really come around and say like, this is, um, we sort of all agree with this. So I think the, I think there are little things that you can do. You don't need to be testifying necessarily in front of a committee this session, but there are ways that you can follow bills. Another thing is, um, you know, like VT Digger has a um, state house recap every day during session. Like you can sign up for those emails. It's super short. It's like, this is what's going on. These sometimes will include some discussions that are happening in the committees and that can just kind of make, keep you sort of up to date on what's happening. And then you can sort of get a sense of who's working on this and, and contribute that way. So those are some of the like practical suggestions as we're, and you know what? It's election season right now. I mean, we have an election in a month. Now's a good time to reach out to, to your folks and say like, hey, I'm a constituent. Um, these are just like, again, you don't need to have solutions. Like, I'm worried about housing. Like, I'm worried about this. This is the population I work with. Like, I'm concerned about this. I care about this. And just say that. And if a lot of people are have, um, some representatives might have like newsletters during sessions, you should absolutely sign up for that. They might say something like, hey, we have, um, I'm gonna be hanging out at the coffee shop like during these hours, you can come by. They like really do mean that. You can really go by and you can be like, I have nothing 
that I want to say except for hi I'm a constituent and like maybe I'll email you during the session and you'll like put a face to a name that's like totally fine you don't need to come in there with this like script of what you want to say uh, love all of those suggestions take every single one of them um, especially subscribing to Vermont Digger's final reading. I like to call it like the Gossip Girl corner um, <laughs> of the legislature. It's my favorite reading at the end of the day. Um, but to Senator Lyon's point earlier about the emails, I think what happens too often is that folks are kind of trapped in the, um, the form letters where it's all you need to do is click send and then it goes off to your representatives. Um, and and the effort that you are putting into your advocacy, I will just say is the effort that I'm putting into your advocacy. If you are going to press a button to send me an email that was written by somebody else, I am going to press a button that sends it to the trash. <laughs> um, not to say that it's not an important email. I've read it, and I've read it the multiple times that it's been sent. But you want to know what always stands out to me more? The three-sentence email that actually conveys like, I am reaching out to you because this issue is important to me and this is how it impacts me directly. Not what somebody else is saying about the issue. I know what the advocacy organizations are saying about the issue. And I know that you probably support where they're coming from. And yet, when we put intention into it, um, we are working with humans at the end of the day. Um, really reiterating that point of citizen legislature, um, we know that we are talking to our neighbors. Those real life experiences are what are actually going to convey us to really look at an issue in a different light. Um, so really sending a short email um, is integral and does have an impact. Uh, I think that's gonna be my big, my big point here is really just, it is the simple acts of actually connecting um, that can have the greatest uh, change and difference. Yeah, I think um, you made this this point earlier, but I think that the <clears throat> excuse me the access that we have as Vermonters to our representatives at every level is really remarkable. It is it's rare, um, and it's something that we can all use um, and we should use. And I think being mindful of, you know, not overstepping the boundaries, but when someone holds a coffee at a coffee shop, they do want their constituents to show up. That is time that they are making to hear um, what's on people's minds. You don't have to be as organized as a Let's Grow Kids. You don't have to be a member of a society. You can write an email. It can be as simple as that. Um, but it also can be a longer conversation and um, I guess, you know, when it, it's important for, for our work, it's important to distinguish between the federal level and the state level. And that can be very complicated because lots of federal funds are administered by the state. And lots of federal programs are run at the state level. But it's not something that your congressional delegation necessarily, you know, we, we have to kind of be careful about um, where we operate. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid are a perfect example, right? So um, there are lots of ways that we receive feedback from constituents. You can call our DC office, you can call our Vermont office, you can send emails, you can fill out a web form, you can ask for a meeting. If there's something that's happening uh, in your place of work, and you, you can invite us to come and see what's going on. Um, and we will be happy to, to try to get staff there. Um, the other function that our office serves in Vermont is that we, all of us, do constituent casework. So if anybody is ever having uh, an, an issue with a federal agency, we are there to help support that interaction. And if something is stuck, we do our best to get it unstuck and help you navigate that. So that that could be any of your colleagues, your patients, your students who are coming up against a problem with Social Security benefits or uh, Medicare um, premiums or 
the IRS or veterans benefits. So that is another way that we, through that constituent casework and that one-on-one -on -one work, that we start to see where patterns are developing and are able to relay that information uh, to the Congresswoman. And the other thing that I would say is that her ability to act as a member of Congress is not just limited to the bills that she writes. And in fact, as a first term member of Congress in the minority, there's not a lot of legislating going on. There's not a lot of legislating going on in this Congress in general, um, you may have noticed, but it's very hard for a first term Congresswoman to get her bills up through the, the parallel process that Taylor described. Um, very proud that uh, one of her bills addressing Addiction After Disasters Act was actually uh, read in committee and marked up and made it through committee. So maybe that will make it to the floor if the speaker chooses to pull that up, which is really a remarkable thing. Um, but there are also, you know, we write letters. Sometimes she will join with the senators and as a delegation write a letter to a head of an agency or um, join a dear colleague letter. There are really um, a lot of different ways that she can use her platform to help to advocate for Vermonters. Um, so I, I would, the, and I think the last thing I would say is if there is legislation that you know that is actually active in the House of Representatives, it's so helpful for us to hear about that. And we can pass that along to our legislative staff in DC um, to have them take a look at it. Because there are thousands and thousands of bills floating around out there. There's no way that any of us could have our eye on all of them. So if there is a particular issue that's important to you and you know that another member has introduced it from another district, we're very, always happy to take a look at that. And finally, I will say, not true of all members of Congress, but uh, Congresswoman Ballant is committed to taking, to our DC staff taking meetings with Vermonters. So that is another way, whether you're connected to a national organization or not, um, you will have a much better chance of getting a meeting with our policy staff if you are a constituent. Some national groups know that and will seek you out to be their Vermonter, but um, we really do prioritize Vermonters for our, for our DC meetings. And I think we're right at time. Um, I don't know, I know that a few of you have to run off right away, but if, um, it sounds like there's two questions online. If, if you all maybe will um, stick around for just a second for people in the room can ask some questions after the session. If you wanna just let me know online real quick. Okay. We just have to be mindful for the next session. Yeah. So the question for the panel, when choosing to listen as listen to as credible sources, given your limited time and energy as our representative, would you please list in order of importance and why the voices you consider most important to listen to as influencing your views on legislation under consideration? Our medical leaders, the healthcare providers, the end users of the health system, patients who have been harmed by the system. Thank you ahead. That's from Cheryl VE. Is there another question? Was there a second one? Uh, it's a comment. So from Cheryl, what will it take for our U.S. Congress people to fight for adequate federal funding for our health care, education, housing, and food security, infrastructure, rebuild, etc.? We understand that our federal government as our sovereign currency issuer sure can create the money it spends, whereas our state requires our tax dollars to fund public programs. Not sure who wants to take that. <laughs> um, we do have, we really don't have a lot of time, so just maybe just a brief comment um, from everyone just to take us out and finalize everything. Just a brief comment. Uh, well, brief comment, um, I listen to everyone who, and invite a uh, diversity of folks into committee on each bill. So we're hearing from folks who are directly affected, ordinary citizens, we're here from professionals, we hear from practitioners, we hear from patients, we hear from everyone um, who's involved. And the balance of all of that information goes into making a collaborative 
um, process and a, a compromise bill ordinarily, and then it goes on to the House and the si similar process. So it's not selecting one over another, rather it's looking at everything um, together. And on the second one, I'll say that we're all a little bit frustrated sometimes when we get unfunded mandates from the federal government, just as folks at the local level are frustrated when the state makes a mandate and then there's no money or insufficient funds or resources. So we all need to be uh, aware of those issues. Uh. I really appreciate your answer there, Senator Lyons, because I was trying to do the, the ranking in my mind and really understanding that the issues that we're facing are so nuanced. When we look at it from any one of those perspectives, we're not actually seeing the fullness of the issue and what needs to be addressed. I think what is really critical in that question is who actually has access to be able to provide that testimony. Folks who are in positions of power, medical directors, even physicians, are more likely to get in the room to be able to provide that feedback. Um, while patients who, ex who have experienced harm or community organizers typically have a more difficult time getting into the room. And so I think to an earlier point made, it, it really is uh, looking at the chairs of the committees as to who they're inviting in for testimony. Um, that will dramatically change which direction a bill is going. So I don't think there is one more important than the other, but I think every single one of those voices needs to be in the room if we're going to understand the nuance of, of the issues before us. And I have no comment on what's happening in Washington, D.C. <laughs> All right, well, we just want to say thank you so much. This, um, this panel has been amazing. It's been incredible to get to know um, each of these people a little bit more through this process. Um, we're so lucky to have such great representation um, here at the state and federal level. Um, so thank you, Representative Small. Thank you, Jessica Nordhaus. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Thank you, Dr. Becca Bell. You know, one thing that Taylor and I really um, talked about with wanting to put this panel together is much of what you've heard is that everyone's voice in this room matters. Everyone's voice in our community matters. Um, we understand that there are um, barriers, structural barriers that happen around power and privilege, and we don't want to ignore that. Um, but at the same time, we hope you walk away from this session understanding that your voice has just as much right to be heard as anyone else's, and that you belong in this process, and you belong um, as an advocate, and your voice and your lived experience matters just as much as anyone else sitting or standing on this stage. And so we hope that hopefully, um, through some practical tips and tricks of how to get involved. This lowers that barrier of entry for folks and will get you involved. And right now, at any time, maybe in history, this is more important than at any other time. To really take an active stance on the things that really matter to you, the things that are impacting your life, that are impacting your communities. We know that are impacting marginalized communities. It's time to get out and vote. Get out and vote. Encourage everyone you know to get out and vote. Call your cousin in West Virginia call your family out and west, down south, wherever they are in your sphere of influence. Get them out, get them to vote, um, and get involved. So thanks so much.
All right, please. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, thank you again. So much. Uh, okay. How much do you have to I left four up here. Hey, folks, does anyone know where the fourth microphone is that was up here? We had four microphones on these chairs for the speakers that were just up here. Oh, thank you. If you are in the hallway and you can hear, we are going to get started for our closing session. If you want to kind of come in or come up to the front, please do so, so we can get some of this good energy from this panel. We'll get started in a minute.